Well, it's great to have John Patrickoff with us on frame. Uh, we got to know each other when he was the president of the New York City Football Club. Prior to that, he was the president and chief uh, operating officer for Tribeca Enterprises and the Tribeca Film Festival. Well, he's got a new venture now, the former NYCFC boss. It's called Athletes Unlimited, women's professional leagues in multiple sports with short seasons, no owners, no home cities, but they've got a network deal. So this is pretty cool. And uh, well, let's welcome him in, the CEO and co-founder of Athletes Unlimited, John Patrickoff. John, nice to see you. Great to see you, Glenn. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I always texted you to see, what are you doing next, John? What are you doing? You know, and you said, hey, stand by, I got something. It'll be in the digital area. That's as far as you, you gave me. But this, this is very unique to the sports landscape. Uh, you and your co-founder, Jonathan Soros. So can you give, give some of the specific concepts? What is this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll actually step back one so I can go kind of give you a little bit of the origins of this. So, um, you know, while, while, while at NYCFC and, and um, you know, working with the whole team there, I mean, I think part of the vision at NYCFC has always been to have a, a women's team as, as part of the, the network. And um, obviously it was really exciting um, that, that we launched a girls team um, while I was there and, and, and with the rest of the team. And so, you know, women's sports, the importance of women's sports, the growth, especially looking at it through the lens of soccer, honestly. And, and even though soccer is not one of the first sports on the Athletes Unlimited uh, uh, you know, plan, um, the origin of this really came out of just seeing the growth that was existing in the women's game. Um, my, my, my wheels started turning. Um, I saw the growth of MLS team valuations, the increasing interest and success of MLS, um, and then looked across at, at what was going on in the women's game. And um, if you flip back now, two years ago, prior to Women's World Cup, um, NWSL, which, you know, I think today um, it looks a lot better and a lot stronger than it did two years ago. Um, I, it was my thought of like, there's just upside here. There's opportunity. There's more should be done. Um, and so I started to get my wheels spinning. I thought a lot about what was going on in soccer, a lot of what was going on in basketball. And about that time, uh, Jonathan Soros, who's my co-founder in Athletes and Unlimited, and I got to talking about this. And he really was the one who planted the idea that if you're going to go get into kind of a new and emerging sport where it's not as established, why kind of replicate the existing model that exists on the men's side? Why not really start from scratch, rethink yeah. what's the best model for a league going forward? And so that is what gave rise to Athletes Unlimited. And um, this concept came around that, you know, maybe you wouldn't create a league with, you know, 10, 15, 20 teams in different markets and have to build out local fan bases and find stadiums. Maybe you could centralize it and put it all in one place. The second idea is maybe, maybe you really put the power in the athlete's hands and, and you figure out a way to get them involved um, in every aspect of the league from governance all the way down. And so you mentioned no team owners. And so that really was the thinking um, that, that started all of this. And we, we, we tossed the idea around for, for close to nine months. And then about a year ago, um, June of, of, of last year, we really got to a place where we we're like, all right, Athletes Unlimited, let's go do this. Let's do what you just described, which is let's launch a network of new leagues that all follow the same model. One city, six week seasons, bring together 56 of the best athletes, uh, four teams worth of athletes. Um, and we're launching in August with a pro softball. And then we have announced that we are following on with in next February with pro indoor volleyball, a huge sport around the world. Kind of reminds me a lot about soccer, actually, you know, huge leagues, a lot of success around the world, massively participated in um, and sport where there's a lot of participation in the U.S., but not a really thriving. Uh, there is no no, no indoor uh, pro league for women or men. Um, and then but there is but but there is a, a, a pro league for softball, which you're kicking off with. So when I first saw that is uh, is this are, are you working in cooperation with what they're doing? We are. And, and so that's exactly right. So my first phone call a year ago was uh, we had this idea for Athletes Unlimited. And then we said, let's go figure out what sport makes the most sense. Um, and I did have some conversations with, with uh, people in, in women's soccer professionally. I did have some conversations with, with, women, uh, with people in women's basketball. But really the one call that where, where somebody picked up the phone and said, this is awesome, is women's softball. That was the first conversation. And it's a woman named Sherry Kemp. She's the commissioner of the National Pro Fast Pitch League. And they're our partners in this. So NPF didn't play. It's, it's been around for a while. 
Um, it didn't play its season this year because of COVID. Um, but our idea was, let, and again, modeled after soccer, uh, think about how many athletes um, in pro basketball in the United States on the women's side or in soccer play in two leagues. So our idea was go play in the NPF, play from your regular season from March to August, and then come play here, uh, you know, late August through late September, you'll make double the money, you know, you'll be able to increase your opportunity. So that was our whole goal from the beginning. Let's not try to replace a league. Let's add to it. And so, yeah, the, uh, like the players from the NWSL, a lot of them go and play in Australia because it works out for them season wise. Exactly. So if we, if we were going to do athletes unlimited in soccer, as an example, we do it in January or February, we'd find a location and, you know, we'd invite the end up, you know, we'd invite NWSL players who, who, um, you know, exactly. Don't go to Australia, stay in the United States. We'll give you a great opportunity here. So that was, that would exactly be the model. That's exactly right. All right. So you, you mentioned uh, giving the players some power. So what exactly does that mean uh, with the, with your model? What, what is that? Yep. Yeah, so, so, so let's start from kind of the beginning. So players um, share 50% of the profits of the league um, and not just in the current year they play, but for 19 years into the future. So you basically have a 20 year profit participation plan. That's the first thing. Second is in terms of actually governance and day-to-day -day operations of the, of the league, for each sport, there's a player executive committee, um, and those players um, help us design rules, format. Um, they get involved in, okay, we're thinking about, you know, two different potential sponsors in a category. Which one do you think makes more sense? All right, we're thinking about this uniform design. What do you like? What do you not like? Um, and then actually when it came to the player recruitment process, so for softball, there are 56 players. It's a player-driven process. The players identify the other players that they want to invite to the league, then we get involved and I, and I help lead kind of uh, along with Sherry kind of, all right, how much we can offer them. But, but the players are the ones who say, Hey, I think this would be a good player to join the league. And it's totally player driven in that regard. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. What, what kind of salaries can the players make that you, you talked about? These are, um, and this is interesting. It's like this, uh, this short burst tournament. Uh, I think you said the softball is over six weeks. So uh, what are we talking about in, in terms of uh, money? So um, players make a minimum of $10,000 over the six week season. Um, they have the opportunity to earn um, significantly more than that through bonuses that they'll be eligible to earn. Um, there's a year end season bonus pool about $300,000 across the whole player pool. So players will be able to make in, in, in softball kind of upwards of 35,000 for, for six weeks. Um, and you know, in volleyball, you know, call it roughly the same. That the, the bonus pool is actually a little bit uh, larger because they're smaller. There are fewer players in, in volleyball, so it gets spread out more amongst those forty players rather than yeah. fifty-six. But we're, um, but that's a that's a you know, listen. Th th this is still a long road to getting these female athletes to be able to make this a professional career entirely. But it's meaningful, right? That's more than doubling what they would have made over their normal season. And that normal season would have been four months long. And if you look back to kind of even, you know, it's, they made some great strides in the NWSL and WNBA. Um, but if you look back, even just a few years ago, the money we're offering is, is, is pretty comparable to, you know, what would have happened uh, at the outsets of these leagues. And again, it's only six week season. So. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, look outside of the U S women's national team players that are allocated to the NWSL teams, uh, if, if you told one of those other players they could make 35 grand over six weeks, you're not going to have a problem getting people participating. That's right. And so, again, that will just be a small number that, you know, at the top who will, who will earn those bonuses. But yeah. nonetheless, it's a minimum of $10,000. And even that isn't, isn't that far off. So, and obviously our goal is to, is to increase that over time. So, um, it, it's, um, listen, it's a long process to, to create – uh, meaningful, viable, professional pathways for, for female athletes in a lot of sports. And, and we're, we're kind of, we're just, you know, part of that, part of that solution. But, but again, from our end, it, it's a lot about um, getting the athletes to a place where they, they, they are making a, a good wage and can be successful as professionals. And then it's also just fan engagement, right? Like we think this new model, and, and I'll explain it a little bit, but basically think about it each week, there are four captains, selected and those captains select their teams they pr practice and play with those teams and in every game you get points based on how well you do um, as an individual and how well your team does your team needs to do well in order for you to score well but you rank up points in the week at the end of the week 
um, the top four players become the captains for the next week. And that goes on and on uh, until the last day of the season. There's no playoffs. There's no championship game. But as you go into the end of the season, a little bit like the Premier League or any other international leagues where there's no postseason, it, those players will all be racing for the top slot. So they want their team to do well and they want to do well individually. And we think that's just an incredibly fun, engaging way for fans to get, you know, this whole idea, every moment counts, every at bat counts, every play counts, there are points on the line all the time. And, um, and you're following well, players rather than, than you're following teams. Well, how exactly do the, the, the fans get involved? So normally if I'm, if I'm doing a, uh, an MLS fantasy league, I'm selecting my team. You've got the players selecting the team. They're getting the individual points, which will go, I, I assume, eventually could go towards bonuses, you know, That's exactly that you right. were talking about. But how, how, do the, um, how, how are the fans, the supporters engaging in this? Yes, yeah, so, so, so the huge part. So, so the first is, uh, I've mentioned two of the components of your score as a player. The first is how well you do individually. Second is how well your team does. The third is an MVP vote. So when the players come off the field at the end of the game, they're going to vote on MVPs. The fans are also going to have a chance to vote on MVPs. So as a fan, you're going to be contributing. Your vote will end up impacting what uh, MVP points a players get and ultimately who gets the MVP and who will be involved. So that's the first example. Second example, um, we're going to be bringing cameras into the, into the ballpark, um, allowing direct interaction with players during games in the dugout. Um, we're going to be allowing for fans to vote on other aspects of the league, um, from music that's played during the games to a whole host of other decisions that we'll put forward to them. Um, so, so really, it's, um, it's a big part of this. I mean, I think you really want and we really want, you know, the fans to feel um, – as empowered as possible and really and really bring them close to the action. Uh, the former New York City FC president, John Patrickoff, now uh, CEO, co-founder of Athletes Unlimited. That's what we're talking about. Really unique uh, concept here on the landscape. So I, you know, this fantasy aspect, I'm sure is going to be attractive. And you mentioned uh, bringing the cameras into the dugout or, or, or wherever, and you've managed to, um, settle in on a, on a pretty cool television deal with this, uh, I guess, starting with the softball tournament, CBS Sports and ESPN. And I think the NWSL, I think of it this way, NWSL has CBS, but all access for all their matches except for the opener and the final. So it's a paywall, you know, it's an additional payment, but you've managed to get on something where people will not have to play, pay a, if they have cable, they need that, but they don't have to pay more money. That's exactly right. So, I mean, I think as a, as a new league and as a new property, um, one of the key elements that I think we, you know, I think we all know is, is, is creating access for fans, make it as easy as possible. So um, if you're a cable subscriber um, and you have CBS Sports Network, you'll be able to watch seven of the 30 games. The rest of them will be on ESPN across their channels. Um, not ESPN Plus, it'll be on the, on the TV networks or on ESPN3. And that's the idea. I mean, you know, all 30 games, um, it was not easy um, getting those deals in place. Uh, it's a crowded landscape. I mean, I think it's great because the networks are still all looking for live games and live sports content still driving, yeah, the, yeah. driving the world of, of, of television. Um, but it was a huge priority for us. The other piece of this is that we've made a really big investment in our original content team. So the storytelling we're doing off the field, um, we're putting the vast majority, we, we, we have a lot of kind of like consultants and third parties working with us on this. But when you look at our internal staff, the majority of people we've hired internally are, are people to work on the content and digital team. So that's where we're putting all the resources and energies. Again, think of the six week season in one location. We're not spending as much or any resources on, you know, traveling the players or figuring out the logistics. It's all we're in one stadium. Let's equip it. Let's make it an amazing kind of, you know, studio where um, and we have access to the players for six weeks while they're in market. So we're going to be telling a ton of stories um, on and off the field. And also, um, we've had this really cool situation. Um, one of our players, we, we really, again, like I said, we want, want the players to be so involved here. One of the players came to us with their idea for a podcast, and um, we actually greenlit the podcast. So she's hosting one of our podcasts that we're distributing called Hard Headed, with AJ Andrews, don't worry, Glenn. We're not putting you know journalists out of jobs. I don't want you. Don't get nervous. This no, is, no, I, I, coming after you. I saw I saw something up here uh, with uh, a podcast as well. So at, we have and, athletes um, unplugged, maybe. Which yeah, the unplugged, the unplugged yeah. thing. So, so actually, athletes unplugged, which is hosted by Julie Stewart Binks, who I I, I first met when she was uh, doing MLS games. I right. remember you know seeing Julie. So Julie's terrific. Has such a great personality. Um, 
knows so much about sports and is also really, really funny. So that, so, so we're doing a weekly show with Julie where she interviews both athletes from Athletes Unlimited, but also um, athletes from around the world of sports. The Hard Headed pos- podcast, which I was mentioning, is hosted by AJ Andrews. And that's an example of an athlete coming to us with an idea. And we're like, yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to elevate your voice and, and, and you know, um, help you create a show. So that's another example, I think, of where um, I think it's typically pretty hard in existing leagues for a league to collaborate with a player on a business transaction. I mean, I don't, I don't know how that really would even work with unions and collective bargaining. So we've, we've, we've broken down those walls. And um, so far, that's a, that's a really exciting opportunity for us. All right. So there's no owners, no home cities. Uh, players uh, are empowered to select the, their teams with the captain. Are there any coaches? Great question. There are no coaches in softball. There are coaches in volleyball. So um, volleyball, like I said, is the second sport that will launch in February. And that's actually uh, in partnership with USA Volleyball. So um, USA Volleyball is our partner. We're the official sanctioned league, uh, exclusively sanctioned league, indoor indoor women's league uh, in the United States. And that uh, that program's being, we're working very, very closely with, I'm sure you'll know, even if you're not a, a volleyball expert, you'll know Karch Karai's name and Karch. That's the only one. That's the only one. Right. So Karch is the, is the coach of the women's national team. Um, and he was the, one of the first people, um, he and, and, and Jamie Davis, who's the CEO of of USA volleyball, who we started working on this uh, about a year ago. Um, right after we got softball kicked off, volleyball was the second sport. And, um, with, with Karch and the team, we've identified a sporting director and he's gonna be hiring four coaches and, and those four coaches will coach the team. So it's, it's important. Remember for both of these sports, they're both in the Olympics next summer. We have 20 Olympians in the 56 softball players. Uh, of our 40 uh, uh, volleyball players, we have 20 signed. Um, a number of those are gonna be Olympians as well. So they're very, very focused on being you know, in training form getting the best, best conditions. And that's, again, one of our major commitments. John Patrick Hoff, our guest, uh, co-founder of Athletes uh, Unlimited and a, a CEO. And I, I think the, the thing here that, uh, that stands out a little bit too is this, is this six-week season. And uh, considering when you're trying to kick this off and we're still in the midst of the pandemic, it's, uh, I, I don't want to say the timing of how you're doing it is, is uh, could could work to your benefit but but this idea was pre-pandemic right it has that look of the nwsl and mls and nba but the, this is the way you were going to do it all along it's exactly right i mean it is a, it, it's a little it's surreal right i mean we've, we've been working for over a year on a plan which was six weeks one location and obviously you know given given you know the terrible things that have happened in this world like you know with covid um obviously all the other leagues have adapted and so our league looks um more similar to them than it, than it otherwise would look. But, but I think the big distinction is we're committed to this format for the long term. This is not a means to an end. We don't have a plan to change it. This is what we really believe in. Um, and, and I think, um, I think that that's, that's probably the biggest differentiator, but you're exactly right. This was the plan all along. Uh, among those who you've uh, signed up uh, as advisors is the national soccer hall of famer, Abby Wambach. And a couple of quotes from her. The first one, uh, she says, Athletes Unlimited gives athletes comfort and security. That never happens with female athletes. And you know, one of my other questions is, what, what drew you to the women's side? Is, is that part of it, what she said? Yeah, I mean, it, listen, I, I think that if you, you know, you, know, you, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other and you know my, my career path here from Tribeca to, to NYCFC, I mean, you know, I, NYCFC, um, City Hall City Football Group has been so committed to community and community giving back. And there's such an interesting and great relationship between fans and their soccer clubs. And, you know, that meant a lot to me. And it was a big part of this. I mean, I'm a big believer commercially in, in the opportunity that exists for soccer um, in the United States. And but but ultimately, you know, I think when people get up every day and go to go to an office and I, I think that's very much was the case at NYCFC. You know, you believe you're part of something bigger, right? You're trying to help bring the world together sport, through sport and obviously supporting the athletes, but, but really broadly speaking, helping communities. And so I think as I thought about my next chapter, that's an important part for me as well. So yes, the fact that it, it feels great to be part of an organization that's helping female athletes, helping kind of address some of the imbalances, but I go back to it. I just think there's a big commercial opportunity here. So I think there's a big opportunity to do more 
Um, I'm a believer long-term that, that pro women's sports is going to succeed. I do think you need some new and innovative thinking around it. Um, and so your belief then, your belief then is that your league athletes unlimited will maybe help stimulate the other leagues and, and, and draw more interest towards them. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that, um, I'll say that a little differently. I think we believe that if we're successful, more pro sports across the board will look like athletes unlimited over time than us going back and looking like the way a traditional season looks. I mean, yeah, I, I believe that if we're successful, you're going to see people at all ages, all the way down to younger kids playing, you know, in an athletes unlimited looking league, you know, uh, everywhere. And, and I, I just think that there's a lot to be said for it. Um, it, it um, I think the concept of geographic rivalry, it's still a very, very powerful factor for, for a lot of fans, but I think that's changing. Um, and I think that younger fans are really more and more focused on individual athletes than they are on, you know, this connection to geography. Americans in particular move around a lot. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, let's take soccer as an example, right? Or, or, or you know, there's an NBA example. The statistics amazing. Something like 98% of fans of, uh, of an NBA team, LA Lakers or, or New York Knicks, will never see a game in person, right? And think about the number. So think about the number of American fans um, who are fans of a of an EPL team, right? Who've never been to that city or probably couldn't even find, you know, uh, Norwich on a map, for example, right? Yeah. But but have a connection to it. So it's not so much about sense of place anymore. It's you have some other way that you became a fan. You, I think a lot of the times, right, it's because you had a favorite player, right? Their favorite player you ended up loving or you love the colors or whatever it might be. So to me, this concept that in for a hundred years in the United States, people have been really rooted in their cities, but it's a much more mobile society today. People grow up, live, move um, around. So, so I think that as you think about pro sports, that is an opportunity, especially for a new league. I'm not saying the NFL or, NBA or MLS even are gonna are gonna change. They've got a great model going. They don't need to they don't need to learn too much from us. But but if you're a new league starting up, I think there's a lot to be said for 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 our model. Yeah, and a lot of this you're basing on these um, player profiles or telling the stories. And you have something where you're going to you have a method to train the players how to enhance their own uh, their own brand on social media. So th that 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 would lend. Uh, that would lend itself to your uh, emphasis that this is a, a big part of what you're doing. It is. It is. I mean, listen, as a starting point, again, I come back to, to, you know, women's soccer where I, where this, you know, many ways my ideas originated, but I looked around, you know, at the profiles of so many of those incredible athletes that are part of the U S women's national team. I mean, you mentioned Abby, I mean, she's been an amazing help advisor and guide uh, to us here. I actually just spoke to her yesterday uh, uh, about, the latest on Athletes Unlimited, and we were going over a whole host of things. Actually, yesterday we were talking a lot about all the great work she does with her organization called Wolfpack um, that does a lot around corporate training and, and leadership development. Um, and we're talking about how we can bring some of those skills to the athletes we're going to be working with because for so many of them, you know, again, what are you going to do post-career? How do you develop as a leader? Yeah. What do you do off the field? How do you take those skills is, is important. So we're talking to Abby about how we can work more closely together with Wolfpack and, and, and bring those things to, to our athletes. But, um, but, but I think that that's, uh, that's really, you know, a, a key aspect of this is you see that they have huge profiles, right? These women's national team members. I mean, let, let's be all, you know, I don't know if you, if you asked who's the biggest star in, in soccer today in this country, I mean, you know, probably most people would say Megan Rapinoe, right? Like I mean, yeah. she's up there, right? And, and, and that goes for a lot of players on her team, um, a lot of the players at the NWSL. So how do you build that? That's a big piece and we can benefit from them and then we can help in turn, you know, help bring them, you know, more advice and guidance. You know, most of them don't have, you know, some do have agents, but again, it's something I'd, I'd seen at MLS too, where, you know, for a lot of athletes in this country who aren't at the top, top of their game, they don't get the type of like, they don't have a team of people working for them. They're typically a one man shop. You know, they often have an agent who helps them negotiate contracts. In some cases they're really lucky and have a great like agent who's really involved, but a lot of them don't have that. And so how, who's helping build their brand. And, and finally, John, you just back to the TV for a moment. Um, uh, this may have come from you. I, I read it somewhere that there are going to be a new technologies incorporated to add to the interest. And, we heard about uh, what ESPN is doing with uh, the MLS's back, you know, six microphones under the turf and, 
you know, just trying that natural effects thing, uh, uh, cameras from above, drones taking shots of the field, and it has been pretty cool. I think they could utilize it a little bit more, some of the things that they talked about, but what do, what, what do you have in mind? Yeah, so, so, so a couple things. So one is, um, one thing I did love about softball right out of the gate um, is it's, a, it's pretty much a two-hour format. The game's fast, it's seven innings, it moves quickly. So to start with, Softball. I used to uh, I used to umpire softball games way back when I had you know a lot of jobs and we love softball man the thing was over in a minute <laughs> it's, it's so it's quick game you know it's incredible stat there uh, this year there were scheduled to be fifteen hundred college softball games on the ESPN networks so ratings from two thousand eighteen to two thousand nineteen were up twenty percent so it's a massively successful TV sport at the college level. Um, we're hoping to capture some of that, obviously, in the pro side. But the sport itself is a great TV sport. That said, we're going to be instituting a ton of technologies. Um, we're working with a, a company called Ross Mobile Video. Um, they have a system called the Piero system, which allows for a tremendous number of overlays. A lot of the stuff you'd see in a typical like M MLB pro broadcast, you just don't get to see in, you know, in a typical women's pro softball game. So yeah. there's so much room for upside there. Um, so a lot of overlays, a lot of digital technology, a lot of stats. Um, and really kind of, I think, elevate what people are used to seeing. And I think that matters. You know, I, I always took it, um, you know, Gary Stevenson at MLS, you know, was such a big proponent of this, right? Like that, you know, it matters clearly what the quality of the play is on the field. But if you don't have good media coverage, fans are triggered to say, all right, it may be great play, but it doesn't look like I'm used to seeing it. And so yeah. I remember from Gary talking a lot about TV presentation and what does the game look like? And so we've really taken that to heart as well of like, it's got to look amazing. The fans need to know that we're investing. Um, we got to support the athletes and invest in them. But then, you know, the fans have to, when you, when you flip it on CBS sports network, or you flip it on ESPN, we want to trigger right in your head. This is top quality. This is there's you know, this is the best of the best. So that's our focus. All right, John, fantastic stuff. Uh, it, can you, any idea when uh, soccer might uh, fall into the mix here? Hey, listen, I, I hope, you know, if, if uh, one of your fans is, is listening or, you know, we have, <laughs> we have anybody in the, you know, the powers that be in, 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 in soccer in this country, we'd, we'd love to do, we'd love to do more in soccer. I think, listen, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a fascinating situation, right? Like with, with U.S. soccer overall and what do the top women in, the, in this country want to do and where do they go with it and how does the sport continue to grow? It, it's, um, there's still a lot of work to be done in all these sports and um, we're, we're excited to be a, you know, a small part of it. And uh, the door is always open. We are, we are actively looking at, I'll tell you, and actively looking, um, you know, at new leagues. So we've got so softball, volleyball, our third sport is on the verge of being announced and we're working actively on the fourth. And then, you know, we're, we're prepared to go, go further and, um, and, and ultimately to men's sports as well. So um, we're excited excited for all that lies ahead, but, but tune in Glenn. I expect you'll be watching August 30th. We kick off. Um, it's at AUProSports.com is our website uh, and all our social handles and the games start on August 30th. Um, and you'll be able to tune in. It'll be 30 games over, over. I think games. you'll have some uh, women uh, in the game of soccer who will be uh, looking on uh, in curiosity to see exactly what it looks like. Again, it's AUProSports.com. Dot com. He's John Patrick Hoff. And when you do start the soccer, John, I'll be very disappointed if you don't hire me as a coach or a commentator. I mean, I'm doing you know. a deal right now, Glenn. It's done. Okay. That's okay. It. <laughs> yeah. You're in. John, best of luck. Uh, really love the concept. And um, it, was, it was great to see you again. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great, great to be here.